Good morning. I will try to give us a quick summary of uh, a number of years of work from around the world on the development of using high energy particle accelerators to produce beams of neutrinos. Uh, beams uh, were put in quotes, the word beam, uh, by the first authors uh, because the, novel, the convention of how to produce a beam is so different from uh, other particle beams. Uh, I have a lot of work to do here and I really want to emphasize uh, something that was mentioned earlier yesterday which was that you know many good ideas have many parents and there are many false starts and although we often will cite certain authors for the first development of a work uh, you'll see over and over again throughout this talk the same ideas were in development uh, around the world. And so uh, it's really, I think, uh, to be a celebration of the scientific community that comes up with the best of ideas in a cauldron of many discussions and uh, brainstormings around the laboratories everywhere. Uh, so I have a few topics to go through in how one produces an accelerator neutrino beam, a so-called conventional accelerator neutrino beam. Uh, before I get started, I think I want to call to mind uh, one of the best of yesterday's lines from John Learned, uh, who said that during the period when uh, all of the underground physicists were doing their work on atmospheric neutrinos and cosmic ray neutrinos, the alligators had gone off to accelerators. And since I'm the first speaker to talk about accelerators today, uh, I thought I'd begin. But I think I want to, because we're in the city of light and the city of fashion, I want to call to mind a different connotation about what the alligator really represents, the fashionable physics here of the day. All right. Um, so there are a number of references of original papers that I could throw at you throughout this talk, except my slides would be full of uh, citations. And what I would like instead to do uh, is refer you to a number of overview articles um, there was, and this I think calls to mind the true collaborative nature of uh, work in accelerator neutrino beams. Immediately after the developments of the first two accelerator beams at Brookhaven and at CERN, CERN held a number of informal workshops and called together physicists from around the world to talk about ideas on how to do this kind of work. There were three such workshops and all of them are written up in so-called CERN yellow reports. They're great references to see the early ideas of how this work would proceed over the coming decades. Horst Waxmith, a noted physicist at CERN, uh, gave a great set of summer school lectures uh, in 1979. Uh, I refer you to his article. Uh, there was a number of uh, workshops held in the early 2000s uh, as the long baseline experiments were coming online, the so-called neutrino beams and instrumentation workshops that was started by Kazuhira uh, Tanaka at KEK. And these were hosted at CERN, at Fermilab, and at KEK. Uh, those are great references, they're all online. Uh, there's also a physics report uh, article written by myself on the history of accelerator neutrino beams, which tries to be comprehensive about citations and, and original work. I will not talk today about beam dump experiments. Uh, there's a very nice review about that, and I will refer you to that review because that's a, never, it's a rather separate uh, body of work. So um, this picture was shown already yesterday. It's the uh, plan view of uh, the experiment done at Brookhaven. Um, I think it's instructive to look at this not just for what it does, but for what it did not do. Uh, this was a, a beam of, of high energy protons circulating in the AGS at Brookhaven. It was not extracted. It was an internal target at this beam line. And in fact, the first extraction was taken, had taken place at, at the CERN experiment, uh, motivated in part because of the magnetic horn. So this was an internal beam. The target would be, let's see, up here, uh, hitting and, and be swept over. The beam would be swept over the side to hit the target. This was the decay volume, or you know, the, the region where uh, mesons would decay to neutrinos and, and muons. The shield was already discussed to attenuate the, mu the muons, and then you'd have the neutrino detector. Uh, so this was, you know, a very crude experiment to get it done for the first time. Uh, as discussed yesterday, the idea had also been talked about by Ponticorvo. Uh, but here was the first implementation. I like this graph because it, I think, conveys some of the evolution of the challenge of neutrino beams. Um, this is, on the vertical axis, the total dose of protons measured in joules. So multiply the energy of your beam by the number of protons, and one gets to significant volumes of en or, uh, quantities of energy dumped on targets. And we go from something like 10 to the 8 joules uh, in, its, in the earliest beams to uh, at the time I wrote uh, my article in 28, you know, 10 to the 13 joules were now another order of magnitude beyond that with beam lines like NOVA and T to K. Uh, but you can see all the other 
uh, beam lines in between from Argonne National Lab, Brookhaven, the CERN SPS, the CERN PS, there was a beam in, in Russia, the IHEP, uh, the Fermilab Booster, the Fermilab Tevatron. Many, many laboratories have been working in this area, and the drive for ever more numbers of neutrinos has meant more and more protons on target, and protons in some cases of very high energy. So these pose incredible challenges for the durability of targets and horns and other materials in your beamline. I will not review every experiment ever done, and so if I fail to mention some particular beamline or another in the course of this talk, please forgive me, but I'm trying to come up with some of the technological uh, innovations throughout this, uh, this period. But you can see here from a somewhat comprehensive list of all the beam lines that have been developed, there are quite a number at a number of different laboratories from Argonne, CERN, Fermilab, JPARC, KEK, uh, IHEP in Russia, and a number of different kinds of beam lines, wide band beams, narrow band beams, so-called quadrupole beams, uh, horn focus beams, bare target beams, uh, with a lot of experiments uh, exposed to these beam lines. Let me just mention a couple of relevant pieces of decay kinematics, which are uh, important for the course of developing a neutrino beam. Uh, in meson decay, the opening angle between the, the original decay, uh, the direction of the, the, the traveling meson and the neutrino uh, is narrow, but not all that narrow. It goes like one over gamma of the, the boosted meson. So for a very high energy pion, that, that neutrino is going to go very far forward. For some of the lower energy uh, beams that we care about today coming from lower energy pions, uh, unfortunately that means that the neutrino beam has instantly got a divergence and our detect detector face, uh, placed far away can see fewer and fewer neutrinos just because of the divergence of the decaying mesons. Nothing can be done about that. Muons uh, travel a little bit more collinearly with the meson. We wish they wouldn't, but they do, and that's good in some cases, but bad in others. And the energy spectrum uh, is never favorable. Uh, you get less energy out, well, you can get one way or another. The, the energy spectrum of the neutrino is flat up to about 0.43 of the pion energy or uh, considerably more of the kaon energy. Uh, these, ener these neutrinos that lower energy are at wide angles, and these energies of neutrinos at the highest energy possible for the meson decay are at the smallest angles. <coughs> it's out of the scope of my time to talk about uh, experiments to measure the particle production in a target. Uh, people have done these experiments over and over again. Every time someone has produced a neutrino beam, there's usually an aha moment where the spectrum is wrong or unanticipated, and they go off and measure the production of pions and kaons off of a target to go back in retrospect and try to understand the neutrino spectrum better. There are anything ranging from single arm spectrometer experiments like this one uh, done at Argonne uh, back in the 60s and 70s to the sort of comprehensive full acceptance experiments like the NA49 experiment used at CERN to measure all particles off of a target uh, at all different angles and all different momenta. And these things, uh, there are many, many of these as well. So again, I would refer you to uh, an overview article on this subject to look at uh, all the different exp the production experiments that have done. And these continue to be done uh, over time. Two facts of importance here, though. Um, this uh, left graph is a graph of the transverse momentum. So if the proton is coming in, hitting a target, and the meson moves with some longitudinal momentum and some transverse momentum, the transverse momentum, is, in a sense, is a divergence of the pion beam or kaon beam off of the direction you want it to go. And that transverse momentum is approximately invariant. It's about 280 to 360 MeV from proton beam energy is as low as 10 GeV up to 450 GeV of the SPS. And that, that transverse momentum, since it's constant, translates to an angular divergence of the pions off the target of PT over PZ, or about 2 over gamma. That's important because it's twice as big as the divergence of the neutrinos coming off of the pions. So this has to be corrected if you want to increase the luminosity of your neutrino beam, because this is now a factor of 25 by the time you put in the kinematics of the decay distribution. Uh, to how, how big your flux will be. The other fact that's important is that the PZ distribution, or XF, uh, is approximately the same shape uh, all across many different proton beam energies. So people who have debated in the past what proton beam energy to use, that's not all that relevant because you're getting about the same spectrum of pions off of the target. It's just a question of quantity. You get more pions off the target uh, per proton at high energy than low, uh, per proton at low energy. <coughs> 
These particular graphs were made using a comprehensive cascade Monte Carlo Fluca that was generated and tuned off of years and years of produ production data. Many experiments have used parametric models of these data using uh, PT and XF invariance type principles. Uh, there are a number of these parameterizations from Sanford and Wang, um, BMPT, CKP. There are a lot of these parameterizations um, that are approximations to this. So let me talk a little bit about focusing of those pions because that's critical to increasing and determining the neutrino flux as well as shaping it. Um, the innovation here is from Vandermeer, uh, who decided uh, an axial magnetic field uh, would benefit from bending positive pions toward the beamline, negative pions away from the beamline for a current that goes along an inner conductor like so and returns along an outer conductor out here. Uh, of course, you can reverse the direction of the current and focus pi minuses and defocus pi pluses. Um, and the key feature of this shape here uh, is that the inner conductor tapers outward uh, so that pions coming at large angles have a longer path to go in this region of magnetic field than pions at lower angles. So they get the lower angle pions get less of a kick, but you want them to have less of a kick because they're already closer to the beam line. This is not the first time someone thought about axial magnetic fields to focus particles off of a target. In fact, Penofsky had come up with such a lens type of idea back in 1950 for talking about producing or focusing particles uh, at, the, at, the, um, at the Bevatron at Berkeley. But this was the first time to think about it in the context of neutrino experiments. And Vandermeer's particular innovation is this tapered uh, conical shape. Uh, in fact, he called it the horn, thinking about the Swiss Alp horn. Panofsky kept thinking about the horn of plenty. Uh, I like the, horn, the Alp horn better, but uh, we'll go with, we'll go with uh, history here. Uh, there are a number of other features important about the shape uh, that determine the, the spectrum of pions coming off of it. I'll just show you these early pictures. These are not small objects, obviously. Uh, this is you know, uh, the, the set of horns used at the CERN PS. Um, they're already pretty big, um, but they get bigger. I mentioned the shape is important. Panofsky, excuse me, um, Vandermeer's horn shape was a, con a conical horn, and that was meant to select pions of a given angle, but at all momenta. And Budker uh, separately came up with the idea of a parabolic horn that was to select pions of all angles, but at a, si a single momentum. So if you were looking for a somewhat more on monoagenic beam, uh, the parabolic horn would work. Uh, this is an interesting little plot of, or a, a picture of some photographic films put in an electron beam before and then passing through this parabolic horn, and you can see it comes down to a nice focus at a particular focal length, which is proportional to momentum. And that's key because you put your target back a certain distance, and that determines when your point to parallel focus point uh, at a, a certain momentum. Horns take on all different kinds of shapes. I mentioned the parabolic horn from Butker. Uh, that was the shape used at Fermilab for the Numi beam. Um, this, the original CERN horn at uh, the PS was a, a conical horn. Uh, there was another shape proposed by Palmer at Brookhaven that was then used by uh, Mini Boone and also at KEK and subsequently uh, J Park, the so-called magnetic finger, which was an ideal horn. Both of these uh, conical and parabolic horns are approximations. If you would think of these in thin lens type optics, the, and the, the target is a point target, which it never is because it's a meter or two long, uh, then these, these approximations work as lensing type objects. But the actual details when you start thinking about uh, long geometries are quite important. And, and Mini Boone and KEK use this so-called ideal shape because it gets you uh, more correct uh, ray tracing through a larger uh, extended horn. And you can see these things go all the way from uh, short little objects at Brookhaven of only two meters in length to the CERN horns up to seven meters in length. Vandermeer, uh, when he uh, was coining the term horn, also coined the term reflector. If you put a second horn at, at two, or two or three locations down the beam line, uh, you can capture more pions that were not perfectly focused by the first shot because, you know, of course, the pions only spending a short time through this magnetic field. Uh, Multi-horn lenses uh, systems were used at CERN already in 67. Uh, IHEP in, in Russia did the same thing, even with four horns in the system. Uh, and you get then complicated ray tracing because sometimes the particle is over-focused and has to get recaptured by the second horn and recaptured again by the third horn. You get to like accelerator type optics with multiple quadrupoles and in fact, uh, a Russian group did this very nicely mathematically. You can start doing ray tracing and get the divergence in, you know, in percent uh, 
uh, or you know, transverse over uh, longitudinal dimensions versus the momentum of the particle and start to capture when you're on or off uh, axis. I'll just skip a little bit. There are other wideband focusing systems, of course. Quadrupole beams, uh, although they have less aperture and tend to focus smaller angle pions, and so they're only useful for high energy beams. They are, in some sense, a way to harden the beam spectrum. Uh, this graph shows, uh, from CERN, shows the difference between no focusing and ideal focusing, and in between you see what a quadrupole beam looks like. Oh, excuse me. Uh, a two-horn beam looks like uh, with at the lower energy spectrum and a hardened spectrum from a quadrupole beam. These were used extensively at CERN and Fermilab. Um, they were so-called quad triplets, uh, even sometimes uh, sign-selected quad triplets where a dipole is placed in between. That would defocus uh, the wrong sign meson and get rid of the antineutrinos or neutrinos, depending on what sign direction you're trying to go. And you see two peaks because you're focusing both pions and kaons of a particular momentum. Other ideas were uh, developed, um, never fully uh, explored. Uh, the plasma lens that used Panofsky's original idea of an axial field from a discharging plasma along the length of the beam, uh, so-called magnetic spokes that created, again, something approximating an axial field or even a solenoid. Narrowband beams were explored uh, at uh, both Fermilab and CERN. Um, and the idea here was to use a quadrupole beam, but then use dipoles to select a certain momentum of meson. This gets you a nice uh, sharp field, uh, excuse me, a sharp spectrum of pions and kaons, mono, roughly monoenergetic. And you see a slight deviation of the energy of the neutrino in the vertical versus, excuse me, uh, versus radius uh, on the horizontal. In other words, if the neutrino is decaying uh, in, at larger angles to the beam axis, at, at a further distance from the beam axis in your detector, you see a softer neutrino than something that's right on axis. So people could really study. Uh, neutrino interactions at a specific energy with this kind of technique. But other narrowband beams occurred uh, over time by putting a so-called plug in the axis of the beam between the horns or on, uh, on the axis of the horns. That would get rid of the so-called smallest angle particles. Those would be the highest energy mesons coming off of the target. Uh, these are complicated, messy things to run because now you've got more production of more particles coming off of the plug as well as attenuating high energy particles off the plug. So they're, they're not an easy thing to implement. Uh, this is a scheme from uh, Brookhaven back in the 80s. But Brookhaven also came up with the idea of the so-called off-axis beam, which is now uh, widely uh, used at Fermilab and CERN. Uh, the notion here is that the neutrino energy on the vertical axis and the, and the pion energy on the horizontal are linearly related for things that are right on axis. In other words, the decay angle uh, is zero. But as you go away from the, uh, the direction of the pion, at even just a couple of degrees, you see that almost all neutrino energies are the same. So you get a couple degrees off axis, a roughly monoenergetic beam. Two detector experiments were explored at Fermilab and CERN. And uh, here's a, a sort of aerial view of, of the CERN complex back in the late 70s, early 80s. And you can see there's really an incredible amount of work going on here. The PS was being used to generate beams and hitting uh, a target here. And then there was uh, near detectors uh, to, to uh, act as near detectors for the, the larger experiments, Gargamel, CHARM, CDHS, and BEPS. Um, but also those experiments were being exposed to both narrowband and wideband beams and even a beam dump beam uh, from the SPS at the same time. So there's lots of activity going on at CERN. But the idea here was then to use a near detector to measure the flux of neutrinos directly, uh, going off to a far detector to do oscillation type experiments. Uh, the same was happening at Fermilab uh, with its high energy neutrino beam. Uh, there were multiple neutrino detectors along the berm uh, for the beam line here, and uh, oscillation result results were explored there that I know will be summarized later in the course of the day. Let me skip that. Um, there are complications in doing two detector experiments. Uh, that's the spectrum of energies of neutrinos is not exactly the same at a near detector and the far detector because the near detector sees a, a, widely, a widely different array of neutrino angles coming off the, the meson decays compared to the far detector. T decay uh, was aware of that and proposed the idea of a not so near detector, I'll call it, uh, something at two kilometers. And that made the ratio of far over near spectra versus neutrino energy much more flat. And so the, the, the T decay so-called two kilometer detector would see a spectrum of energies of neutrinos very similar to the far detector uh, at Kamioka. Um, 
Another idea to, co to combat, combat the fact that detectors don't see exactly the same spectra was proposed by Adam Para uh, at Fermilab, noting that the neutrinos coming either to the near detector or the far detector are coming from the decays of the same mesons. So if you wanted, you could simply make a map or a scatter plot of what energies of neutrinos you see in the near detector versus what neutrino energies you would be expected to see in the far detector. And it's a scatter plot. So for every neutrino energy here, that leads to some scatter of neutrino energies that you expect or flux or spectrum of neutrinos that you expect at the far detector. So although they're not the same spectrum, they're relatable. Other ways of knowing the neutrino flux came from measuring the muons in the beam. And that was done already early in the, in the 60s uh, at the CERN experiment. Um, this beam line, which had three horns, had also the shielding down here and a number of slots in the shielding to look at the muons. And the further into the depth of the, the shielding you were going, the, the more high energy the muons were that you were looking at. And of course, the, the angles of these muons said something about the energies of the muons as well. Uh, so Waxmas and others were looking at, uh, this is a, a spectrum of muon intensities versus radial distance from the beam axis at many different shielding depths. And they were using this kind of information of muon intensities to get a direct measurement of the neutrino flux, which would be valuable for cross-section measurements. And in fact, this work was then used to tune up the, the then in use Sanford Wang parameterization model of what the flux would look like. And they got an altered flux, which is actually altered by a significant amount. If you look at the vertical there, they, they come up with a substantially different flux than what was originally going to come out of their parametric Monte Carlo. Uh, other beam lines have used this. Uh, Waxmith did the same technique at the WANF beam in the late 70s, early 80s. We did the same thing at Fermilab. Um, you know, the, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, the narrowband beams have done this kind of work, and they actually have a little easier time because in a pion beam going through a quadrupole triplet the, and, and dipoles, the pion beam is just basically a pencil. And so it's very easy to stick either ion chambers or Cherenkov counters in there and measure directly pion and kion proton, uh, and proton content and then look at positives and negatives uh, as you flip the sign of the beam. So it was very easy to do fluxes and narrowband beams, relatively speaking. So I've given you a very, very quick tour, and I know that a number of the speakers coming up uh, in a bit will talk about all the exciting physics that came from these high-energy accelerator neutrino beams, everything from the Ws and Zs and, and validation of the V minus A model to looking at deep inelastic scattering and QCD, the discovery of lepton flavor, and then eventually neutrino masses and mixing. And I think it's, one, you know, it's once again important and exciting to think about the fact that the evidence for any scientific uh, phenomenon in our field has come through a lot of experiments, a lot of careful knowledge produced at multiple facilities, and our idea of what has directly produced evidence for X, Y, and Z, whether it's the tau neutrino or the W and Z or many other fe features of the standard model have come from careful experiments done by all of us in the world community, and it's exciting to see all these ideas come together. Thank you. So for this uh, exciting talk and uh, impressive amount of results and experiments, actually. So, questions? Thank you very much. It was a really nice talk. Uh, I had a little something on the first table which showed the Brookhaven beam starting in 76. Uh, but I think very much that in 75, uh, Bob Palmer presented the results from the seven foot bubble chamber in that beam. You could be right. Uh, so you're talking about this thing. Uh, I probably pulled that uh, line off of a publication. So whenever I found a first publication, it doesn't probably represent the first beam oh, or right. even results. Oh, I see. So, uh, but, but so I can tell you for sure that this BNL 1976-28, the fourth line, yeah. that was, must have been in operation in 74 already. It, it well could be. I, 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 as I say, I tried to pull a, off a publication from each of the experiments of these beams, and that might be the first publication. Remember, those are the guys who said they discovered the lambda C. That first beam and that's 74. OK, so maybe I'm, I'm off by a paper then. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Vigno APC. The, the beam which has been built for the first uh, new, for the discovery of the new mu uh, at um, BNL, why the CERN was not ready at this time to, to, do, to do the beam? Because there was a beam at CERN which... Yeah, I, so I, I can't... I, I wasn't uh, around at that time. <laughs> um, CERN was doing a number of very ambitious things. And so I, I assume it wasn't ready or they had reasons to delay the start. Um, 
I mentioned that not only were they developing the horn, and so this was an incredible current being pulsed through this magnet, uh, but because they had this short pulse magnet, they also were interested in getting a short pulse of proton beams. So they were developing this so-called resonant extraction, uh, uh, a fast extraction technique at the same time. So it was a very complex beam line, relatively speaking, to Brookhaven. I assume, uh, but I, I can't speak uh, from firsthand knowledge, that all these developments happening at CERN took a little bit longer. But of course, then that facility was the facility that was used throughout the 60s with some variations of two horns versus three horns and so on. I, I don't know. Maybe okay. others here could speak firsthand. You know, the first, the first, is it okay? The first commandment should have been blame it on somebody else, right? I mean, I mean, I'm sure that Moses came with the wrong stone table when he came from the mountain, it, because and that's what happened at CERN because there was a professor von Dardel who had made the calculations, and and Jack Steinberger always blames him for having made the wrong calculations, and Jack discovered that the uh, the beam was not good enough, and then he went to Brookhaven and did the experiment over there. And when they got a Nobel Prize, I had the very great fortune of talking to one of the people in that experiment who said Jack was absolutely essential for, for getting the experiment done because he would not go to Schwartz. Please don't tell anybody this, okay? <laughs> he would not go to Letterman, but he would always go to Jack Steinberger who had the solution to all the problems they were facing. So that's a part of history that very human, I mean, a human part of history. These things do happen. Okay. It was just calculation. I mean, they realized that they had done wrong calculation and the beam was not good enough to discover the, the neutrino. Okay, thank you for that comment. Uh, concerning this question which just came up, uh, I think this CERN experiment had two problems. First of all, the flux, was, flux calculation was wrong by a large factor. And secondly, the detector didn't work. Uh, the detector was liquid scintillator uh, in, in a plexiglass housing and it, uh, the scintillator ag was aggressive and so it dropped. The, the liquid came out and, and so the detector didn't work. So I think this is a pity. <laughs> yeah. 